Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Earth Laws Month. We are delighted to have a very special discussion with two people who I think are legends within the deep ecology movement, John Seed and Pat Fleming. In a moment, I'll invite them to introduce themselves. But firstly, I will do a little bit of a proper introduction with some slides if all my buttons work properly. So my name is Michelle Maloney. I'm the co-founder and um, national convener of the Australian Earth's Earth Laws Alliance. Um, but before I tell you a little bit about AILA and Earth Laws Month, I'd like to acknowledge country. I am absolutely delighted to live, work and play on the unceded lands of the Cubby Cubby and Jinnaburra traditional custodians. I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present and emerging young people and wise leaders um, who are continuing the culture, governance and um, practices of caring for country and caring for each other that have been in place since time immemorial. As has become the Zoom tradition, um, I do invite you, if you wish, to pop into the chat where you're from, uh, where you are today, uh, whose country you live on, and um, perhaps just a hello. That would be very nice. Um, I always like to situate myself too in when we acknowledge country. Um, for me, it's not just lip service. Uh, I'm a descendant of Irish convicts who were brought here as part of the British Imperial Project. Um, and as a non-Indigenous person, I've spent many decades exploring, learning, unlearning and grappling with how uh, a colonial country can move into a future that is fair and just for all. And of course, in my particular bias, how we can place the health of good country and good relationships at the centre of our society. So what I do want to do now is just mention for those who don't know, AILA, the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, we are a small but mighty national not-for-profit organisation. Our core objective is to increase the understanding and practical implementation of earth-centred governance. By governance, we mean the rules that we create to live, work and play together as human beings at all scales of our lives and society. We're interested in systems change, but we also, also tend to delve deep into particular silos to critique, rethink and redesign things like law, economics, education, Western knowledge, ethics and philosophy, and with a healthy dose of arts, creativity, love and happiness. So that's a little plug for Ayla. Earth Laws Month is really just um, a series of online events throughout September. Uh, if you haven't already seen the program for them, we will pop the links into the chat again. And we really urge you to join as many as you can or catch the recordings later. Every event will be recorded and will be available within a few days after the event on our Ayla website on the events page and also in Ayla's YouTube channel. So please do have a look, have a share, um, come back and ponder all these lovely conversations that we're having. Which leads me to today. As I said, I'm really delighted to invite John Seed and Pat, Fe uh, Pat Fleming to join us today and have a good old yarn. Um, the format for our session today, um, and I'm really looking forward to this, I've invited John and Pat to each take about 15 minutes to talk about their lives, their lives, their work, how they got to where they are today, sort of the origin story of people who've been working in their areas and their field for some time. And then we'll have a bit of a joint discussion, the three of us, and then we'll just open up for Q&A and have a good old chat. So um, without further ado, what I'd like to do now is invite John um, to say hello and to share with us for around 15 minutes the story of John and then we'll ask Pat to do uh, a similar a story of her work and life to date. Um, and then we might have a bit of a special chat about that awesome book, Thinking Like a Mountain. I am fascinated by the Council of All Beings and any process that invites me to think like another animal, plant or creature um, is pretty damn fine by me. So, John, if you'd like to unmute yourself and say hello, that would be fantastic. Thanks so much, Michelle, and thanks everyone for showing up. So um, I came into this space um, long ago. Um, I guess I'll start in 1973, 50 years ago, when I uh, returned to Australia after five years living in London. I'd left my job as a systems engineer for IBM, um, ran into um, Buddhist meditation, first in Nepal with Lama Zopa and then in India with Goenka came back to Australia um, and got together with some people and built a meditation centre at the Channon in Nimbin. 
and um, then uh, created a community called Bodhi Farm nearby. Um, <clears throat> we grew our own food, built our own houses, delivered our own babies, and uh, organized meditation retreats and meditated. I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life uh, engaged in that way when um, mysteriously in August of 1979, I somehow found myself uh, enmeshed in what years later we realised was the first direct action in defence of rainforests, not only in Australia but anywhere in the world. And this happened um, at Terrania Creek in what is now the Nightcap National Park. Um, it was uh, amazingly successful. I think now that the society had yet to develop any antibodies to the kinds of theatrical expression of people climbing up into the trees and chaining themselves to bulldozers. But anyway, for whatever reason, we were easily able to be the first item on the news night after night. And the time was complete was clearly ready because um, uh, the society followed um, with enthusiasm um, and less than two years later and 200 arrests later, an opinion poll found that more than 70% of the people of New South Wales wanted an end to rainforest logging and uh, the government of the day uh, responded with a string of national parks that stretched from the border ranges down to Barrington Tops, and that included uh, Terrania Creek in the Nightcap National Park. The following year, we were invited to come down and help to set up a blockade in Tasmania uh, to stop the damming of the uh, Franklin River that would have flooded the heart of the uh, temperate rainforest wilderness of southwest Tasmania. Um, more than 3,000 people attended that event, uh, more than 1,500 people were arrested. Two years later, we were up at the Daintree to protect the tropical rainforest. And once again, as in Tasmania and in New South Wales, uh, national parks and eventual World Heritage listing rewarded our efforts. However, um, it became clear during those years that um, for every forest that was protected in the first half of the 1980s worldwide, a thousand forests had been destroyed and clearly there was no way to save the planet one forest at a time. That unless we could address the underlying uh, spiritual or psychological disease that allows modern humans to imagine that we can profit from the destruction of our own life support systems, clearly these actions would be of no significance as far as the future of the world was concerned. Here we were in the middle of uh, um, a mass extinction um, such as the world had not seen for 65 million years and how were we to respond? And this was the context for discovering the philosophy of deep ecology. The term was coined by the late Arnie Ness, professor of philosophy from Oslo University and according to him, underlying all of the symptoms of the environmental crisis is the illusion of separation between human beings and the rest of the natural world. And this illusion of separation, he said, was the result of anthropocentrism or human centeredness, the idea that human beings are the center of everything. So according to this, we are the crown of creation. We are the measure of all being. The world consists of humans on the one hand and resources for humans on the other hand. The world is a pyramid and human beings are on the top of that pyramid. And um, so uh, Ness said that because this um, illusion of separation and anthropocentrism was so ancient, um, going back at least as far as the Old Testament, where we learned that we are to subdue and dominate nature, and nature is to be in fear and trembling of us, that we weren't going to be able to think our way out of the mess that had been created. Famously, he said that ecological ideas won't be enough to save us. What is needed is ecological identity or ecological self. And he said we need community therapy to heal that illusion of separation and to nourish our ecological identity. So I was very moved by uh, his philosophy 
But uh, other than uh, preaching it as far and wide as I could, um, nothing really changed until 1986 when I had the good fortune to attend a workshop being conducted by Joanna Macy, an American Buddhist philosopher and activist that was in Australia doing workshops she called Despair and Empowerment. And uh, uh, there I learned the uh, incredibly powerful um, techniques of personal and social change that she represented. And she learned about deep ecology from me and both of us understood the significance of this and we got together the following week after we'd met and we um, walked in the rainforest of Terrania Creek and created the Council of All Beings, the first of the uh, experiential deep ecology processes and an attempt to give substance to Arnie Ness's call for um, community therapies. Um, a week later, uh, Joanna was uh, scheduled to do a, a, a training for uh, facilitators of um, despair and empowerment in Sydney, and she invited me down, and we did the first Council of All Beings together down there. And uh, both of us have been um, continuing with this work ever since, uh, sometimes together, but mostly uh, have gone our separate ways. Joanna now calls her work the work that reconnects, and um, there's a large um, network of people around the world that are facilitating these things. Uh, um, we've recently started a, um, a, a, a regular Zoom meeting of facilitators of this work in Australia and New Zealand, and there are over 50 people on that uh, mailing list. So um, about a year after meeting Joanna, I um, wrote to her in some consternation, saying that I was so enthusiastic about what it was that we were doing, but that um, I kept having ideas about processes that would seem to be promising as far as um, you know, um, ending that illusion of separation and uh, uh, nourishing ecological identity. And I kept finding opportunities to facilitate things and to try these processes, but to my bewilderment, everything that I did seemed to work. And how could that possibly be? And her reply was that her understanding was that um, if there was a separation between uh, the natural world and human beings, all of that came from our side. Um, the earth never pushed us away. And that the moment that a group of people get together with the shared intention to heal that illusion of separation, the earth comes rushing back in. And it hardly matters what we do after that. As soon as we, as soon as we take that intention, uh, almost anything will serve as a vehicle for the, um, for the insights and uh, the realisations and the feelings to arise. And that was um, quite a relief to me because uh, I was much more comfortable with uh, chaining myself to a machine than I was to facilitating a group of people. And uh, it was then that I realised um, that um, it had nothing to do with the facilitator, that uh, all, all that mattered was uh, people's intention in coming together and um, everything else took care of itself. A year after that, um, I think in 1989, well, 1988, uh, we got together with Pat and Arnie Ness, Joanna and myself, and we wrote Thinking Like a Mountain towards a Council of All Beings, which perhaps we'll discuss a little bit later. And then a year later, I was in the United States uh, facilitating these workshops, and somehow found myself um, as a witness of a, a ceremony of some Indigenous people in the Southwest, Hopi people. And uh, the whole community was involved in this ceremony on a mesa um, where their village had been for thousands of years, they said. And uh, there was just a handful of us outsiders watching. And to my astonishment, I saw that they were doing the Council of All Beings which I thought that Joanna and I had invented a few years previously, but which they assured me they'd been doing for 10,000 years without pause. And uh, 
then I realized that the uh, metaphor of a therapy wasn't very useful, that uh, a therapy is something with a beginning and an end. Therapy shouldn't have to last 10,000 years. And uh, um, that um, as I looked into it later, I realized that I couldn't find a single example of an indigenous community that had maintained its cultural and ceremonial life that didn't have regular ceremonies that allowed the people to gather and to honor all our relations and to remember our interconnectedness with the larger earth family, to let go of our social identity for a while and to allow our ecological identity to emerge. And um, so now I see this more as a kind of a cultural reclamation project than a therapy. And um, I'm facilitating these workshops only in Australia now. I'm unwilling to fly um, abroad anymore these days, but um, at least once every month, I gather together somewhere uh, in Australia with a group of 30 or 40 people and uh, we um, nourish our ecological identity and uh, um, allow ourselves to experience our rootedness in the living earth and allow the uh, inspiration and uh, vision and guidance uh, that come from that uh, to uh, fill us. So um, I may have uh, um, had my 15 minutes, I think, so I'll hand it uh, uh, over to Pat. Thank you so much, John. You were well within time. Um, and thanks so much. We'll come back in a moment. But for now, over to you, Pat. We'd love to hear a little introduction to you and your work, or you're not an introduction, but, you know, an overview would be lovely. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Thank you for inviting me. And hello to everybody. Um, welcome. I'm here on a very, very wet day down in Lutruwita, Tasmania, in the Palawa um, country. And I've only been here just two months. I've just come back down under from living for about, mm, I don't know, 40 odd years in the UK. Um, if I go right back, my roots, a little bit like Michelle, I've got Irish, my whole family is Northern Irish, um, but I grew up in the South of England with my father working as a naval scientist uh, designing radar systems for nuclear subs and for destroyers. And from a very early age, I was able to go into the um, Admiralty establishment where he worked and look at how some of these weapons worked, which was amazing at 14 to be able to track with a rollerball, a large map of the whole of the Southern England skies. And if you wanted to, you could arm it and take something out which was extraordinary. My father would talk to me about the submarines as well, which he probably shouldn't have done. But So I was aware of um, growing up in the nuclear age and I became very aware about the dangers and the awfulness of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that was um, in the 40s. I was growing up in the 60s and the 70s. And we were scared. We were under the cloud of the possibility of nuclear annihilation. And it was something that there was training going on all over the world, what to do, how to um, go under the table or whatever, which for a kid and a teenager is a bit of a, a kind of um, a black outlook on growing up. And I remember from sort of about 14, 15, going, joining uh, the campaign for nuclear disarmament my father had to tell his security bosses, and um, if I'd gone out with anyone who might have been a communist member, it would have been reported, and I would have had to be, I don't know, some some sort of uh, action taken to stop me going down the red path. So there was this tension, if you like, of growing up where the material things were improving, material life was improving, but there was still this vast shadow. I was lucky enough to grow up near the coast and go off on my little bicycle and go and fish stickleback or go and watch rabbit go hunt for foxes um, uh, and be on my own, which, you know, as a, a again, a kid is a great um, gift. So my connection with nature and my love and desire to just be quiet in nature came from an early age. 
I um I went through school with a lot of other naval kids and saw how their parents moved them all over the, the, the planet to go to different naval bases and it left them very disconnected. The children of those families didn't find it so easy to make community. Um, I couldn't wait to get out of Portsmouth and get out of England. And in 1972, I was lucky enough to go and volunteer on a re rehab camp at Kent State University in America. And that opened my eyes to the Vietnam War because Kent State University was where the Civil Guard opened fire with live ammunition on a student protest and killed four people. Um, and I was a, only a year or two before. And the bullet holes were still there in the buildings where we went every day. The, the madness of war um, could kill its own people. And I found it a fantastic experience to travel all over the States as an 18-year-old and just go with the wind and see what happened. Um, I came back and went to uni in Edinburgh and I studied psychology and my my background has been quite a bit in mental health and psychology. Asking the question is why do some people cope and why do some people fall apart and what makes the difference? So I was lucky enough to do a master's for four years and dive into an awful lot of um, understanding about how the human brain works, how the psyche works. In those days, they called it psychopathology, what goes wrong, mental illness, as it was called. Um, and I came out of that after four years. Um, some of the work in there had been anti-psychiatry, R.D. Lang, saying we do not need to medicate people who are suffering or struggling. Um, there are other ways of helping people deal with their feelings and their difficulties. So I, I came out of that and work, I wanted to work in the psychiatric system. So I worked in a psychogeriatric facility for a year on the uh, ground floor with about 30 people um, in a ward five days a week, just finding out how life was for them and trying to make it a bit better. <laughs> we did bread baking and all sorts of things. And then I heard about a project in Sydney that was a radical project um, called the Council Street Project in Bondi Junction. And the uh, New South Wales Authority had given funding to a group of psychologists and psychiatric nurses to try alternative ways of working with people going through emotional struggle, working not necessarily with drugs unless people really, really wanted them. So I went and had three years working as part of the team there, um, which was fantastic. And I learned an awful lot. Um, I did one-to-one -one counseling. Um, I worked in group work and we had some great um, mentors uh, guiding us, uh, a Jungian priest and a Jungian psychiatrist. So. I started to do some depth work and look at, you know, what is soul? What is what are the things that heal us? What are the things that give us meaning? And not to be frightened of going into um, what might be called the, the you know, the, the, the valley of the fear of death or the dark side. And actually to realize that starting to express, to break through the fear of madness, of losing it, of going off into la la land, actually um, the process of just taking a step through that threshold was one of um, deep growth for people, um, spiritual, personal, social, all sorts of aspects of growth that they had been held back on the other side. So that was fantastic to be able to do that for um, a number of years, three years, and then another year back in England working very similar work. But I came to a point where I had to stop. I was a bit burnt out. I'd had five years of front line. Um, and I needed to ask some questions. I joined a Buddhist community. Um, and it was at the same time as in England. So this is going through to about 1983. Um, Greenham Common, 1982, 1983. The Americans were starting to bring over extremely large multi-headed um, nuclear weapons, um, ICBMs that they based at Greenham Common. And you may have come across this. There's a fantastic um, documentary that um, explains it all worth looking at. And so what happened was that women locally and then throughout England 
um, and Scotland and Wales, um, started to rise up and say, we do not want these weapons stored, not only stored at this old air base, um, but that every so often to stop the Russians actually targeting specifically those weapons, they would load them up on very large tankers, on low loaders, and they would drive them around the English countryside through little villages and back again. And the women um, in increasing numbers circled the camp and said, no, you won't. Um, and you won't do this in our names and you won't do this in the names of our children. So there were, uh, I think it was about 14, 15 K perimeter of this air base. And um, the, I, I went and joined in um, some of the, the circling of the air base. So we were able to have, I think one time 30,000 women holding hands and circling the whole of the, um, the air base. A number of women set up camp there for months and years, and they were really harassed by the, um, the US military, unfortunately. Um, but in the end, the air base was closed down, which was a sense of how just enough people holding hands and standing up and saying no can be immensely powerful, can change things, just needs enough of us. Um, there was one time when there was a call for women and children, and, and the men went along as support um, to do another um, round the base. And I just was in quite a state of despair. I didn't know that that would make a lot of difference. I didn't know what I needed to do. And I had seen an article by Joanna Macy called Despair Work, and I put it to one side. I, I looked at it and thought, I better read that. And then I thought, I don't want to read that. So I had this put to one side and I thought, right, I'm going to do some personal work. Instead of going out and protesting, I'm going to sit in my room and really read this article by Joanna. And I want to take time to think about it and respond to it. And that, that, that one article changed my life um, because she addressed the despair that I was feeling and looked at how going through the darkness and the lack of hope and the lack of future together with other people, not on our own, but together in small groups can be an immensely healing and releasing process. And I took her at her word and she had an introduction going on about a month or two later in Lancaster up in the north of England. So I packed my bags and went up and joined her um, introduction and then I joined in an intensive five day training because it was a bit like the floodgates opening and I needed to just release all the stuff that the pain, the the anguish of of not having a future, of not believing there could be a future. Um, and find that there were a wonderful group of people who were prepared to go through this together. And that the flip side of speaking our pain, and we did it in a ritual that is not so much used now, but Joanna was really looking at what are the rituals from different cultures around the world that can help um, heal uh, the, the group, the people who are taking part, the culture, the community in which they're embedded. So we were doing one, um, a system called the Despair Circle, and that was incredibly powerful where you had the opportunity to either, <clears throat> you had the outer circle holding the group, the middle circle moving around, stomping, uh, expressing anger, rage, fear, um, or whatever. And in the center was a place where we could go when we couldn't take anything else, where we just needed to go in and be held. And that was <laughs> incredibly powerful work. The um, and that was the despair work. And the flip side of that is that we came out singing and dancing and we came out feeling that actually together we could do something, we could make a difference. We could invent things. One of the exercises Joanna gave us, which was a tricky exercise, I have to say, being English and a bit reserved in the Irish English, um, we went out for an afternoon and we door knocked around a local town. Um, the town happened to be Barrow and Furness where they build the Trident nuclear submarines. So we were knocking on houses on the doors of ordinary people. We had no idea who they were. We were in pairs. Um, the shed where the Trident submarine was being built was behind us. And we knocked on doors and said to people, 
um, we're on an educational course about the state of our world and we want to talk to local people about what they feel about it. Um, what do you feel about how things, when you look at the world, how you see things, what is it that um, you're concerned about? What are your concerns? And we had fantastic conversations with people who were building the submarine and um, a sense of how many people know that things are wrong. And this was a long time ago, but it's still true for now. How many people know things are wrong, but don't feel powerful enough to do much about it? The, um, yeah, that was really powerful. And I came back and started using my mental health group work skills to offer the work that reconnects has become the work that reconnects. And there was a whole network set up in England and Britain that's called into help um, at that point after Joanna. So this was um, 1983. We, we worked for about a year, just co-training each other up, facilitating work, giving talks, doing stuff all over the place. There were a lot of people from the Quaker movement. Um, there were a number of Catholics, a number of Buddhists, all uh, atheists, pagans, all sorts of people coming together to work on this. And um, I needed to return to Australia because I had residency. And if I didn't return by the 30th of April in 1984, I would have lost it. So I arrived at the airport, got my uh, passport stamped and arrived in Australia and thought, now what? And it was, it's interesting how timing beyond any individual can kind of coalesce things. So I started um, the, uh, within Sydney, different people invited me to give talks and workshops and introductory workshops um, and started to find other people who wanted to lead this work and started to um, help train uh, facilitators and co-facilitators. Um, and let's see, it was, it was quite a dynamic time. There was a lot going on. Um, Joanna had been invited out in 1985 by people at Bodie Farm. Um, John Allen had found her book and her book is a seminal book. It was at that point, it was called Despair and Empowerment in the Nuclear Age. The latest version of that is, um, uh, uh, oh, I've, I've put it in the, the link, <laughs> I'll remember it in a minute. But we were working on the Despair and Empowerment stuff at that point. Um, and so I came up north um, to Bodie Farm, where John was a co-founder, and started leading work and co-facilitating with people prior to Joanna coming and getting ready for her trip. And um, she turned up uh, for a month of quite intense um, workshops around Australia and training up of facilitators. So I um, accompanied her on quite a bit of that and ran the press campaign. and. Um, yeah, it was a very, very dynamic time. And it culminated in what John was talking about with a five day intensive in Sydney, um, which was pretty much about 50 people who wanted to be facilitators who wanted to take this work forward. Um, we pioneered the Council of All Beings there. We pioneered quite a lot of work that was a straight, you know, coming into the culture. Um, and I guess if I fast forward from there, um, the work took off in Australia. John has talked a bit about that. We'll talk about thinking like a mountain a little bit. Um, I can't, I've, I've done work since then in a number of countries. Uh, I've been invited and I've done a number of other things as well. But um, the work that reconnects has taken me to places like uh, quite remote parts of Western Turkey, working up in the mountains where we had a mixture of international people on a whitewater rafting championship and local villagers, local Turkish people, all joining in exercises together with translators. Um, this work has gone to many, many different places in terms of the networks. It's been ground up, ground upwards, people being moved and inspired, as I was, to pick it up and run with it in whatever their fields or whatever their communities or their, their place. So. I've, I've joined in a few of those in different ways, been invited, and particularly in the last sort of 12, 15 years, was involved with Schumacher College, which is a college in South Devon that's looking at how to change paradigms, how to shift consciousness to make a better world. And I've led a number of workshops there, including one I, I just contributed a little bit of deep ecology work to, which was run by Polly Higgins, 
Now, Polly, some of you will know, is a wonderful, was a wonderful uh, barrister who set up um, the Stop Ecocide uh, campaign and charity. Unfortunately, she died just a few years ago, but that campaign has taken off and it's really inspiring, <laughs> really wonderful to see that. Um, I think the only other thing I wanted to say is that I was trying to remember where I met John and it was at the um, at the time of the Terrania Creek blockades in 79. And he and I have touched base with each other in all sorts of places through this work. Um, so we've been up in Daintree together, the Daintree Rainforest in Northern Queensland. Um, we've been in San Francisco um, at uh, Interhelp Conference in 1987. Um, we've worked together in Findhorn, a big community up in the north of Scotland, where we were training um, and deepening people's experience of this work. And then, <laughs> latterly, I arrived in Australia two months ago, and John was on the phone saying, hey, Pat, <laughs> do you want to come and help me with some webinars uh, about the work that reconnects? And I said, sure, you know, why not? Let's see where this goes. I had no idea what, you know, landing here would bring. And that was the first thing, really. So I'm now in touch with a lot of people in the Deep Ecology Network Facilitators Network. And things are cooking. Things are, things are happening. So I think that's all I want to say at the moment. So back to Michelle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. That was fascinating. Um, both John and Pat, it's just so lovely to hear your journeys and to sort of connect some of those people and places and developments like um, when you both met Joanna Macy and building the Council for All Beings. Um, and let's chat about that. John, I just reminded you're on mute there. Um, one thing would be nice to talk about is your experience creating the book Thinking Like a Mountain uh, towards a Council of All Beings. Perhaps we could start, not everyone knows what that is. Um, would one of you like to just talk about what a Council of All Beings is? And then let's perhaps talk about what it was like working on that book and what inspired you, Joanna Macy and um, Arne Ness to collaborate. Well, I, I don't remember much about uh, working on the book. Um, my memory's um, very unreliable. And so... Perhaps I'll speak about the Council of All Beings, which is something that's um, much closer to me, um, as it's something that I facilitate. And as the facilitator, I participate in um, many times every year. So the Council of All Beings is a, um, a process where um, each of the participants is invited to speak for some non-human being. And uh, this could be a plant or an animal or a feature of the landscape. It could be a drop of water or the Pacific Ocean. It could be the Milky Way galaxy. And sometimes it's like a plastic bag. Um, it can, can be anything at all. Um, when we wrote Thinking Like a Mountain, we actually included human beings in the council in a ceremonial fashion. But I've found that uh, whenever there are human beings at the council, they tend to take over can't help it, poor things. They just take up all the space. And so uh, I find uh, the councils much more interesting without humans where we get a chance to hear from the voiceless ones, the ones that we never hear from. And so I have, at least for now, banned humans from the councils that I facilitate. And then uh, we, um, we have a process to uh, connect with that ally. Uh, and the process is um, very much about um, being open to being chosen rather than choosing. And uh, so we go out into nature for a little while and uh, we, we think, uh, hey, I'm going to be at a council of all beings in half an hour. Is there anyone out there who would like to be, uh, who would like a voice because I'm still available and we wait and see what comes to us. And if nothing comes to us, then we can just, uh, when the bell rings, we just choose something and then we gather together and uh, there are mask making materials and uh, we spend a little while making a mask to represent our ally and then we go through a, a ceremonial portal and enter the council of all beings where the instructions are that uh, um, when you're speaking for your ally you speak in the first person i am echidna or i am mycorrhizae and if we 
have a reason to speak about humans. We remember there are no humans present, and so we speak of humans in the third person as they or the two-leggeds or the uprights. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, if we've prepared anything to say, which we can't help but do, we say that as quickly as possible because it really begins when we no longer have any idea of what's going to happen next. We no longer have anything prepared and we just find ourselves engaged in a conversation. And it's not necessary to believe anything. You don't have to believe that this is actually the spirit of the Pacific Ocean that's speaking through me. We just have to let go and um, be, you know, allow some childlike uh, quality of openness. Uh, but always we hear voices that we've never heard before. And always it's very moving and profound for the participants. Um, I don't know what you'd like to add to that, Pat. Yeah, a, a couple of things. Um, so when when we first kicked off in 1985, I think it was, the Council of Beings went through a kind of period of, of development and looking at what else could add to it and what else would help it. And that process is represented in the book in 1987 that John and Joanna and I and Arnie Nace was invited in to contribute. And the book came out in 1988. So there was a sort of reflective trial, get on with it, let's see what works, what doesn't work for the Council of All Beings and what helps. And also fairly early on in that piece, John, you came to me with a massive uh, computer printout in the days when computer printers didn't do pages, they just did reams and reams of paper with lots of holes along the side, if you remember. And you'd written the universe story. You'd been really inspired about um, the latest myth, creation myth that we have of the you know 13.8 billion years of, of the universe. And you'd written this kind of like a, a, it wasn't a rant, it was like a poem, it was like a, a metaphysical reflection. And you were kind of like, how can we put this <laughs> into a workshop? So um, that was one part of the process. And that's in the book, Thinking Like a Mountain, called The Universe Story. <clears throat> and it's something that we do often as a kind of meditation, as a bit of storytelling. I like to get people to lie down make themselves comfortable and we'll read to you like a kid and so we read the story of the universe and that might take i don't know 20 25 minutes and then I, what i'd love to do is to then say oh it's about mm, four and a half billion years ago from present time and the universe is emerging into a new form and it's earth and life on earth and uh, I like to get people to start to participate actively rather than just listen or go to sleep or whatever to a story and go from single cell and explore what it's like to be just a single cell, just a blob of um, you know cytoplasm and <laughs> whatever. And to, I would often um, lead people actively from there and it could take maybe up to two hours um depending and maybe co-lead and have a drum going of changing life forms and going from single simple life form through to um starting to develop having a spine and vertebrates and going through the different forms of vertebrates and coming into mammal and going through different kinds of mammal and most people, not everybody, if someone doesn't want to join in, they just sit and listen and watch. But most people join in. And so maybe you've got a room of small uh, cats, civets, or kind of getting slightly larger um, into tiger or, or, or starting to leap around. And people get really engaged. They get four legs and they start to kind of do the best they can. But the real thing, the real... <laughs> The real energy kicks off, I've found, when you go into grade eight. Um, people love it. Um, you know, you can, uh, gorillas are great fun, although they can be a bit scary, but when you're a bunch of gorillas, you have fun. Um, and also chimp, and chimp and bonobo are kind of a bit closer to human as well. And so people, there's a lot more communication, there's a lot more social activity, there's a lot more looking after the kids, the elders, the grooming and everything. And then I, I lead people into the, the stage, which is, oh, okay, we're starting to um, 
get this sort of bipedalism, you know, standing on two legs and having a, a hip structure that lets us support our uprightness and go into early human and take people through some of the earlier human stages and finding fire and communication and social structures and looking after kids and teaching each other and cooking. And, and then we start to go to about 10,000 years ago to the early origins of agriculture and people out there sowing and reaping and, you know, getting stuck into the land. And then we go through sort of medieval times when we're in villages and, um, you know, there's a lot more of us. And then we, I, I start to bring people to um, industrialization. And there's such a, a wave in the room of going, no, <laughs> we don't want to go there. <laughs> don't make us go there. And I just keep telling the story, inviting people to explore it. And people are sort of wandering around coughing and kind of, you know, kind of being lying on the ground. They're exhausted. And, and then we come into the 20th century and the 21st century. And it is such a melee at that point to bring us into the present. And how did we get here? Well, we started off a long time ago and here we are. Um, bring everybody back to the group and this is it. This is us. Uh, where do we go from here? And so that's part of the whole process as well that goes around the Council of All Beings. And um, I often do that before we do a council. And then people have had a chance to explore other life forms and like to go and find whatever it is that, that calls them. That is fantastic. I have to say, I, I know a fair bit about the Council of All Beings and I know the universe story, but I've never heard anyone describe how to enact it and live it. I think that sounds fantastic. Um, just before we move on from the book, I wonder, could you tell us a little bit about the purpose of the Council of All Beings and, and some of these activities? Would you say that they're mostly so people can imagine what it's like to be other living beings or are you using or helping people use the council of all beings for the literally decision-making processes so that human beings can at least be compassionate enough to factor in other non-human beings uh, what are your feelings on the purpose or the usefulness of it and that's a very utilitarian kind of question but there's a reason for that can i start pat yeah okay. please so um for me, it's both of those things. And uh, indeed, um, after we got used to how much uh, uh, really important advice was coming from the Council of All Beings, we started to almost script that in. So there was one council where uh, the count in Canberra and where uh, the different beings were saying, look, we're Australians as well. How come... Only human Australians get to make decisions and get to, uh, you know, uh, decide on the future. Uh, and uh, um, the, the council decided that what uh, it wanted humans to do was to represent us, uh, it, you know, in front of the decision makers. And we all ended up on the Monday, maybe not everybody, but most of the people from the council ended up with their masks on outside Parliament House as the Polly's came to work uh, with a large 44 gallon drum, which we were making a lot of noise beating on and, uh, you know, calling out um, who, who who speaks for us, who speaks for the non-human beings in there, what about our interests and so on. And uh, in a similar vein, some years later in the run up to the um, New South Wales state elections in 2003, um, several councils of all beings um, wrote the script for a film um, called On the Brink, which starred four endangered New South Wales species, um, koala, yellow-bellied glider, masked owl, and spotted tail quoll. And we had costumes of those species, but we also had filmmakers donated the natural history footage. And we had a little drama where the script of the drama was actually composed by non-humans in the council and then became part of this film, which um, uh, for three months before the elections, uh, we went to a hundred different uh, villages and towns and cities around New South Wales with a truck with a huge stump on the back of the truck. And we'd go through Main Street at lunchtime with uh, the four costume creatures handing out leaflets 
about tonight's uh, pres uh, about tonight's film screening, and then at the end of the screening, when the lights went on, there'd be these card tables up the back with letter writing materials, and we'd invite everybody to write letters to the government about uh, our demands. Um, Ten days before the elections, the Premier Bob Carr announced that if re-elected, uh, the, the ALP would protect the forests in question, 67,000 67, hectares of old-growth forest. Um, uh, more than 80,000 people attended those screenings and wrote letters, and uh, a month after the elections, those forests were uh, reserved in national parks. And so all of that grew out of the Council of All Beings in a very practical way. That is really wonderful. And it's actually a nice segue into, I had a, a couple of questions for you that I was curious about. I was wondering what kind of feedback you get from the participants in your processes. I would imagine some of it is quite, um, not so much, maybe an epiphany or a revelation. Um, and what kind of feedback do you get from people about how they may or may not do things differently after they've done these processes? Mm -hmm. Well, having run a number of Council of All Beings at Schumacher College with um, people who were part of a year as uh, training as um, nature wilderness um, connection guides, um, we found that it really helped that people had reflective time as well as participatory time. Um, so that for different people, they they get a revelation and excited about the connection they'd made with a particular creature. Other people would get ideas of what they could take this work into. Um, but the encouragement was to have a, if, if people could, have a, a diary with them or maybe go off and sit in the sit spot quietly to reflect from the intensity of the workshop what it was for them that came up, what it was that calls. And I still encourage people, you know, people, some people can be doing wonderful actions out there in the world other people may be working very quietly within their community their church their childcare, their forest schools or whatever so you know that the, there are many parts of the jigsaw where people can contribute to healing and turning this mess that we're in around there still is possibilities for that um and the, the one thing that john mentioned right at the beginning and the one thing i'll come back and encourage people to keep nurturing is imagination because if anything's going to get us out of this, it's not necessarily logic and linear thinking. It can be a way of coming together with a group of people where lots of um, sparks fly and you get sparked in some way and to let your imagination just go with that. And um, so the, 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 the part of the Council of All Beings that we haven't really mentioned, it's very much involved in the work that um, reconnects. Um, is the going forth. So having had these revelations or these deeper experiences, giving yourself some good time within the group or within small groups to look at how you ground your experience, how you land it and how you enliven it. Um, and a little bit of that process is, um, can involve uh, exercises where we talk to our ancestors for guidance, or however we um internalize and experience uh, ancestors and the ancestors can be other beings not just human at all and um <clears throat> then look at also dialogue with future beings that are our descendants that we the world we're creating now is the world that they're coming into and living into so taking that sort of deeper time uh, perspective as well and the the last thing i'll say that when i'm encouraging people to ground their experiences I'll ask them to remember that it's not all one giant wave, that we're all kind of waves in a bigger swell. And there's times when we will go forward and we'll throw out our energy or we'll engage or we'll try to make a specific difference with something. And then there's a time when the, the wave sort of has an undertow and goes back and just waits or rests or reflects or picks up some other waves to, to join in with. So that there's, there's cycles and seasons in being active and it's really important also to rest and reflect and to look after yourself because it's a long haul we're on. In the early days of a lot of environmentalism, I saw people incredibly burnt out by having participated and seen awful stuff and tried to change it. 
and failed and feeling a failure and really falling apart from that. So I've always encouraged people to see it as a cyclical, as the spiral, you know, in terms of um, taking... Well, stuff. burnout is is prolific today too. So people do need, they need continuing to need this kind of support and coaching. And John, I wonder what kind of feedback you've had or thoughts and responses from people or how they've used your tools uh, in their own work. Well, um, while Pat was talking, I just remembered one example. I mean, over 40 years there, I could talk for many hours about this, but one example which I think uh, um, speaks to this was um, in the United States, in Maryland, uh, not far from Washington, D.C., I was participating in a workshop and one of the participants in the sharing circle uh, uh, told us that she worked uh, in the Department of Defence, she worked in the Navy, and not only was her job classified, uh, that she couldn't talk about it, but the name of her job was classified. She couldn't even tell us the name of the job that she did. Um, and at the end of the workshop, she was so moved and she and she asked this question saying, well, you know, uh, uh, everything's changed for me and I'm wondering what, you know, what I'm doing with my life, whether, you know, whether I should stay in the Navy or not. And um, my response was, look, I, I don't, I can't give a, any advice, but uh, it seems to me that um, it's really important for someone who knows what you know to be in the position that you're in because there's probably not anyone for a thousand miles from you that knows what you know and that surely you'll be able to do something good with it where you are rather than, you know, like it's not going to be any use for all of us to just clump together and leave the rest of the world to go its own way. Anyway, 12 months later, I was back giving a workshop in the same place, and there she was again, and she told us the story of how she'd gone back, uh, but she changed. She was still in the Navy, but she changed her job that the Navy would... Um, would uh, basically all of the plastic that uh, uh, the plastic waste on the Navy ships would be dumped at sea. And she had been able to create a new position of uh, making sure that every Navy ship had a machine on it that would bale the plastic into bales and take it to land again. And she'd been working on this for um, some months when she discovered what happened to the bales after they got to shore, which was they were taken out to sea and dumped again. And she went to her commanding officer uh, in a fury about this, and he said to her, it's none of your business. Your job is to make sure that these bales, that the plastic is put into bales and taken to shore, and beyond that, uh, forget it. And so now, once again, she was in a quandary as to what to do, whether she should um, you know, risk her career by standing up to her superior officer. And her conclusion was, she said, I'm going to stand up to him. She said, I don't work for the Navy. She said, I work in the Navy. I work for the ocean. And so that was just something that happened to one person and um, that um, I remember many years later. Mm. No, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, and... I was also wondering in the work that you guys and girls, I always say guys and girls, sorry, the work that you have both been doing, uh, reaching out to people and supporting um, these wonderful imaginative processes. I was curious to know if you have felt that the processes over the last few years have become more grief oriented because we all know that climate change uh, is real, is happening is escalating faster than many thought. Or, and what I find interesting, Pat, about your personal story, you mentioned, and I didn't actually know this, that some of uh, Joanna Macy's early work was about the despair of folks through the nuclear age, which I know we're still in, but I was a generation also terrified of nuclear war. So I wonder if you could both comment on, are you finding more people more sad and depressed or is it always the same? People continue to try and to be optimistic whilst also dealing with that counterpoint of sadness? I, I think there's a greater need than ever because I think more people are aware and woken up to the magnitude of what's happening um, across the board, across the board. Um, I, 
I just think that if it it can be made, the work doesn't have to be as um, big as we did, you know, big workshops as well, to make it easy to just have small exercises and listening exercises um, where people can speak about their pain in a way they don't even know. Um, there was a woman who was very involved with Joanna in the early days, and she was a stand-up comedian called Fran Peavy. Um, and one of her favorite exercises was to just take a notice board. She'd make a big notice board and she did it in different places, but she, her notice board said American or American woman willing to listen and sit in a public place and just talk to people and be a listener, be a really good listener. Um, and there was a time when there was a whole group of us circling uh, Parliament in Canberra. It was a women's um, camp. Um, and we did a lot of work that reconnects exercises to help people uh, feel what they were feeling, but not act it out. So if you're feeling really angry, don't go and rip stuff up and throw bollards through the doors or whatever. Um, but it was all women and we knew that the, it would attract angry men. And the men who were working with the women put listening posts all around the outside of the women circling parliament saying men willing to listen and talking to the guys who were turning up and they were it was incredibly powerful to hear some of the conversations they had so that's kind of spin-off work from the intensity of working within the work that reconnects that is like you know can we be listening posts i was thinking about that about the yes campaign about being a listening post in downtown devonport or somewhere in town just a sign saying yes yes person willing to listen giving space to other people. And the one thing I learned from my time in mental health is that when people are fearful and angry, um, they don't want you to remind them about that. They want you to go away. They want to get rid of you. They might want to try and destroy you. Um, and when someone's really angry or coming at you, um, kind of going, you know, whatever their response is to whatever you're saying is to engage. And Joanna calls it sustaining the gaze, but just to... Uh, be there for that person because that person is part of this world and part of this universe who's suffering about what's going on and I, I sort of ground myself I breathe and I'm available I listen and I learned that quite you know I learned it quite a hard way when I was in mental health work that actually the person is probably deeply terrified underneath their anger and they just want someone to listen to them. I couldn't agree more. And in the early 90s, when I started working with Indigenous colleagues in central Queensland, we would find taking a deep breath and listening to very angry white people um, and listening to what is effectively really a lot of fear, a lot of nastiness too, but a lot of fear about their place in the world and what was going to happen. Um, listening to those people was very, very hard, but she had taught us a lot about the power of just sitting still and letting people vent and also eventually they run out of energy and then that's a nice time to have a conversation um but john what are your thoughts on like the grief the i guess i perceive in the last 20 years both an escalation of effort more and more people amazing people doing fantastic work mm -hmm. um but a much more widespread discussion about just the horror show that we're seeing um in the ecological kind of signposts of what's going on well, I, I think that it's of the utmost importance and it's, in a way, the the heart of the work that reconnects what uh, used to be called despair and empowerment and what Joanna calls now honouring our pain for the world. And the piece of it that I think um, uh, is, is the most important is that these feelings that are banished in polite society were never invited to express our deepest feelings of anguish and rage and terror about what's happening to our world and we're frightened of these feelings we've been taught to fear these feelings if i were to fully feel the anguish of what i know is happening to my world surely i would be crushed i'd be destroyed i'd become hopelessly depressed i'd commit suicide something terrible would happen no that when we create a safe container as Joanna has taught us to do, that invites these feelings and that honours these feelings, nothing terrible ever happens to anyone. Um, no, we don't ask people to sign a release form before they come into the circle 
you know, that I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times, never lost anyone, their only feelings. However, they are part of our intelligence that for one thing we can know for certain about our ancestry is that for more than 4,000 million years, every single one of our ancestors has been intelligent enough to reach the age of reproducing itself before it was consumed, without exception. And an incredible pedigree when you think about it. And 99.999999% of this was before we grew this bulge over our nose and started to think our way through the world. What we call feelings is what remains in us of this primal ancient intelligence that led us unerringly through the turbulent centuries and millennia and uh, millions and millions of years uh, to be able to to be able to be having this conversation now. And so that when we uh, suppress that intelligence by refusing to acknowledge certain of our feelings, um, all that we're left with is our thinking. And our thinking is actually sterile, is impotent without the passion that the feelings bring to it. But if we suppress that passion, we can know what's going on. And, you know, when I first became an environmentalist, I thought my job was to raise awareness. If everybody was aware of what was happening, we'd be okay. Wrong. Everybody is aware of what's happening and we're far from okay. And I, what I've learned from Joanna is that it's by enlisting the help of this ancient intelligence, which has stood the test of time. Unlike thinking, the, the, the consequences of thinking remain to be seen. But uh, the consequences of feeling is the incredible world that we see around us. And so, uh, uh, you know, and what I found is that we go from honouring our pain for the world, the, 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 the circle where people are encouraged to hear each other's deepest feelings of anguish. Um, we, go, we go on to seeing with new eyes is the next section that uh, the scales fall from our eyes when we do this kind of work. And it's extraordinary the exuberance and the enthusiasm and the vision that wells up once these feelings, like although we're unaware of these feelings, we've not only suppressed the feelings, we've suppressed any knowledge of the fact that we're suppressing the feelings, but it's a primal force that's been selected for in every generation, this feeling intelligence, and it needs an incredible amount of energy to keep it down, and that when we allow all of that, it's not that we do a despair circle and then do an empowerment circle. Empowerment is everybody's experience when the despair has been honestly acknowledged and invited and allowed. And so there's a the, the deeper that we go into these feelings, the, the more uplifted we feel uh, just a few hours later. Hmm. Now, that's really lovely. And I, you know, as a descendant of the the, the folks from Europe, um, and particularly, I guess, the streak of Englishness in my background, I do find our culture, my people, do tend to bottle things in a lot more than many other cultures. And I find personally, well, my friends know I refer to myself as a piñata. I often say don't crack open any level of grief because it'll all come out. And even I, who spend day in, day out thinking about all this um, really remarkable work and work with amazing people, I get frightened of what will happen if we let it all out. So it's actually nice to hear that, you know, you haven't lost anyone, that people let it all out and then they they can rebuild from that. So that's very comforting, I think. Just a quick reminder to anyone in our audience, if you have questions for any of us um, or other people, please pop them into the chat. Um, the three of us are just going to continue with a fabulous conversation in the meantime, because I have a couple more questions. And I know that John would like to also touch on um, an issue dear to my heart, which is the rights of nature. So we might come to that in a moment. Um, one thing I did want to ask you both, and particularly, John, you mentioned uh, in one of our discussions about chatting with Cormac Cullinan um, and engaging with the thinking around earth jurisprudence. Um, I didn't give much of a talk about earth jurisprudence because I'm just facilitating this lovely discussion out of my own interest and to make sure that John and Pat's beautiful work is shared with others. But 
Ayla was formed literally in response to what I thought was an excellent framing of the structural issues inside industrial societies um, articulated by Thomas Berry. Um, in the book, The Great Work from 1999, he turns his attention, um, which for many decades was looking at cosmology, the universe story, um, a whole bunch of very beautiful writings. He turns his attention to governance structures, to law, economics, education, and the role of religion in Western societies. And so Ayla has, uh, because a group of us were we came together at a conference and got very interested in these issues, we literally spend our daily lives thinking, how, how do we create systems change within governance? And also, how do we still go down the rabbit hole of those particular siloed so-called Western disciplines of knowledge like law and economics and make institutional change? So, you know, that's a confession of our area of interest. And what I'd love to know from you, um, both of you, is when you look at some of these personal journeys that people have and that you help lead them through, um, that connection between their personal lives, their personal work and their professional journey. It was excellent to hear you talk about that woman in the Navy who really started to think about her work, her role. Should she stay? Should she go? What should she do if she stays? So, um, John, I wonder if you could start and perhaps even talk a bit about your interaction with Cormac and others who have been looking at um, Earth jurisprudence, what we often nickname Earth, <coughs> to wrap up all of all of those structural things uh, in our societies. Well, just um, your invitation to participate, Michelle, just reminded me of Cormac, who I hadn't thought about for some time, and reminded me of meeting him and uh, hearing his presentation on Earth jurisprudence when we were both um, uh, presenters at the World Wilderness uh, Congress in uh, Cape Town, South Africa in 2001. And I had been very influenced by Father Thomas Berry. Uh, he was uh, perhaps the most influential um, Catholic theologian of his era. And his, um, uh, you know, the fact that uh, he had turned to uh, governance and jurisprudence, much to my surprise and maybe everyone's surprise, um, and had influenced me a lot. And so to meet Cormac, who was similarly influenced, and to see where this was going was very exciting indeed. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Thomas because um, he's influenced uh, the deep ecology work considerably that um, when um, Pat uh, spoke about the... Um, um, evolutionary journey that she leads people through um, and the story of the universe. Um, <clears throat> one of the one of Thomas Berry's uh, colleagues, Sister Miriam Therese McGillis, uh, responded. What Thomas called, he, he said uh, that we, um, every culture has a creation myth and that uh, the 10,000 cultures of the earth each have their own creation myth. And suddenly he saw late in his life that he was no longer a theologian, but had become a geologian. His attention turned from the God of the religion as it had been described to him and as he had represented to the earth itself as the source of everything, including human beings and including all of the stories that human beings tell about cosmology, about who we are and where we've come from and about the divine. And he said that these 10,000 stories, which includes the Christian story that he had represented, were all very beautiful, but they were, um, they tended to be at war with each other. Not only was the Christian story at war with the Muslim story, but that, um, but that um, the, uh, uh, Catholic story was at war with the Protestant story and the Sunni story was at war with the Shia story. And he said, it's too late for all that. He said, what we need now is a story that unites us. And so he wanted a, a, a story that could unite all of the different stories that would acknowledge and celebrate all of the different stories. And he thought that the story revealed by empiricism was the only one that had a chance. He said that a Buddhist astronomer could agree with a Muslim astronomer. Both of them could agree with what they saw when they looked out into the universe. 
But he said, we can't leave it to the scientists to tell this story because the scientists don't know how to tell a good story. They tend to explain things away. And in order to be a creation myth, he said, we need the poets and the artists and the musicians to tell this story. And one of the people that one of the many people that responded to Thomas was uh, his colleague, Sister Miriam, and she created a ceremony called the Cosmic Walk, where uh, we create a spiral of known length, and there are a number of candles. In my version, there are 23 candles starting in the center of the spiral. We light a candle to represent the flaring forth of the universe 13.7 billion years ago, where we tell the story of the remarkable fact that anything exists at all because it could have turned out that nothing existed, but that's not what happened, and here we are. And so we light that candle, and then we light a taper from that candle, and while chanting a, a song called Child of the Universe, we walk around that spiral, lighting candle after candle and telling the stories, much as Pat uh, was uh, describing earlier, and we watch the universe lighting up and developing and, and flaring into existence. And we're, the the spiral that I use is 50 metres long, and so we're uh, less than half a metre from the end, and it's still all dinosaurs, and we realise that it's not possible to build a candle that's small enough to accurately represent the human story, that what we think of as, as the history is just the tiniest flicker at the uh, end of this uh, remarkable tale. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, John. Um, as someone who's a fan of Thomas's work, it's, it's always delightful to hear other people talk about him. And that cosmic walk combined with the universe story, um, I've been lucky enough to have been invited. In the early days of Ayla, I was somewhat of a curiosity. I'd get invited to faith groups discussions about uh, Thomas Berry's work. And they would always ask, what's a lawyer doing? building their work around Thomas Berry. And I'd say, well, if you look at the great work, it is literally a call to shift governance systems. And it was exciting for a young environmental lawyer, actually I wasn't that young, uh, to come across his work and go, wow, this is great. This is exactly where my critique of our Western system has a cohesive framework. So, and then doing that cosmic walk, um, you know, no matter how aware you are of the remarkable, remarkable gift that is this living world, uh, it's always a shock to realise, you know, to be reminded that humans pop up just at the end, uh, so far anyway. So thank you. And it's, it's great to celebrate also, like one of the candles on my cosmic walk is the end of the Permian era, the, the fifth great mass extinction 232 uh, million years ago when 95% of all of the species of life on Earth disappeared. And then we realised that incredible burst of creativity that where the remaining 5% radiated forth and filled the world with all that we love today. You know, there's a tremendous sense of uh, security for me that comes from realising the extraordinary resilience of nature. It is wonderful you mentioned that, John. I don't speak of this very often, but me personally, when I'm filled with grief about what we're doing and the extinction rates of animals and plants, etc., that's what I think of. I think that Mother Earth has suffered these blows to life before and something has emerged. It may not be us. In fact, I'm a little certain that long, long, long term, it won't be us. Um, but, yeah, the fact that something will continue to live and become, as nature loves to do, become diverse uh, again. So that does give me a little bit of long-term geologic hope. Um, we've got a really lovely question from Philip. Uh, who's saying, I'm loving this conversation. How do we get these discussions, these ideas out of, I think echo chamber is what he wrote. It, it may be a little unkind, um, <laughs> but but I agree. How do we get these conversations into a bigger proportion of society? And I often point to, let's imagine if mass media, crappy news channels, dodgy governments actually shared um, the stuff that mattered. Imagine how mass communication could be used to bring uh, a really strong, deep culture into place that would allow these conversations and support and subsidise these conversations in schools and work and organisations. And uh, Anyway, that's my little daydream. Um, what are your thoughts on how we get um, not just sort of deep ecology and tree hugging, but the real deal of what it is to be human into the world? Well, I, I know that 
thousands of people have taken bits of this work into schools and into their workplaces and other places to try and invite. And it's it, the, Philip's question is just making me reflect that I, I, I don't necessarily know the answer and I think we have to cook it up. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's something that what I would encourage is either I've been quite reactive at times. People invite me and I go to stuff, but we're talking about being proactive, getting out there and starting stuff. And where I would start from, I wouldn't do it on my own. And I never encourage any of this work um, to be a, a hero out with your cape flying, trying to save it all yourself. Um, find a core group, find a buddy, a um, few people, can be three people, four people who maybe have done some of this work together and keep going. So you might do a workshop or invite any of the facilitators, there's there's dozens of facilitators in this country, aren't there, John, in the Deep Ecology Networks, um, to come and lead an introduction. But that if somebody comes and does it, or if, if you're a facilitator, to look around at where you could do a little int introductory talk, a little presentation, something that's an invite to people, and then find for yourself and encourage other people to find for themselves a small buddy group and cook something up. Um, who is it that you know best to talk to? Who is it that uh, you feel comfortable? Who is it you feel uncomfortable with? Um, don't, you know, again, bring in imagination. Um, find a way of courageous, having some, some courageous uh, conversations. <laughs> and it can be quite wacky. It's quite interesting. Um, John and I, years ago, we were in Findhorn and there was a Sarawak, Penan people in Sarawak had written this incredibly moving letter about please don't log our forests, you know, because th these are our ancestors and these are our children and these are all who we are. And John and I were in an office at Findhorn. We said, oh, yeah, let's get this out. Let's see who we can send this to. So we sent it to The Guardian. Um, not knowing if they'd, they'd print it. We just said, this is something that's come to us and we want to pass it on for people to read. So the Guardian printed it. <laughs> I got a very big slap on the hand because um, I'd mentioned Survival International that I was a local uh, coordinator for and I hadn't got their full permission to reproduce the letter, but they thanked us as well because they were getting all these responses around the country. And one, <laughs> one got into a local newspaper, a woman read it, and she went down to outside a supermarket that was in her town that was cutting down some trees to make a bigger car park. And she got out the bike chains and the locks and she locked herself to those trees and said, I'm not moving, these trees aren't going. And she got it to the national press from reading just one little letter that we'd thrown out through the letters pages and newspapers. So never underestimate even just putting a communication out to people where it might land. Um, another thing I've been quite kind of I, I quite enjoy, but it's a fairly wacky thing, is writing poetry to politicians. <laughs> that is... <laughs> oh, wow. A poem. Um, well, so... I just had this image of me writing a poem for Dutton. Like, anyway, please yeah, continue. Yeah, no, do, because you could come up with some quite wacky stuff that might actually have legs. I, I wrote it when the Iraq War, when the vote for Britain going to the Iraq War was happening and there was a lot of deceit. There was a lot of fake news in the government about the Iraq War. Um, I wrote a two-page poem to Tony Blair about, you know, don't do it, just don't do it. Um, and I got a really nice handwritten, not a letter from him, but from one of his minions. Um, and I just feel that if we find uh, unlikely ways to speak and put stuff out and keep doing it, you don't know where it's going to land. You don't know who's going to pick it up. Mm. Um, you know, to from that proactive, from that imaginative, from that creative, and and from you know, I've, I've worked a lot with groups of writers and poets where we encourage each other and we support each other to get our voices strong. Um, you know, to to find a way of doing something else. So, um, Phil, Philip, you asked that question: um, Are we all talking to each other? Well, let's find ways of talking to other people. And who is it that you know each of us might? feel that we might have a courageous conversation with to just say do some of the active listening questions what is what are, what are your concerns about the world mm. you know 
Look, mm. and I agree. I, I think your comments are wonderful because there's a lot of even environmental groups who aren't aware of this kind of these processes. You know, many of the folks on this call are connected to community groups, local groups. They might even be members of national or international groups of all kinds and suggest to them, did mm. you know about these processes? Uh, here are stories about how to do it. And I will repost in a moment. Um, Pat was kind enough to share a list of resources, suggested reading, etc. I put it in the chat earlier, but I'll pop it in again in a moment. You know, often just suggesting things to people or offering to run things or offering to coordinate, like, dear Greenpeace, do you run these things? If you don't, would you like to promote it to your folks? And I offer to do one here in my town called blah, blah. So anyway, um, John, do you have any thoughts on how we get more of these ideas out into the world? Well, I I like everything that uh, Pat said, and so this is not in, this is and on top of that. But um, what I think of here is um, something that um, there's a um, there's a, a method of inviting back the original nature of a place, which was developed by two Sydney sisters called Bradley. It's called the Bradley Method. And what they found was that if you want the original vegetation of a place to return, no heroic tree planting is required. Um, what you have to do is to recognise both the natives and the exotics, both when they're mature, but also when they first pop their heads out of the earth as little seedlings. And the process consists of pulling out the exotics without treading on the natives. And um, the reason I uh, bring it up here is because that there's a further stipulation that you may be um, tempted to start where the devastation is the most extreme, some erosion gully in the area that you're managing. But if you start there, uh, it'll break your heart and you won't succeed. The only way that this works is to start from the strongest expression of native vigor in the area that you're managing and work back from there. So if it's a, a field that's been mowed for a hundred years, but there's a corner that the mower couldn't reach and a few annual weeds are straggling through, you start there because then uh, pretty soon the pioneer species of trees begin and basically year after year, you back out um, removing the exotics, not treading on the natives. And to your amazement, some years in, uh, the climax species begin to emerge because you've created the conditions that allow them. And eventually you stumble into that erosion gully. And by that time, the whole thing is so strong that it takes it in its stride. And so I, I because deep ecology says that human beings are part of nature and that therefore natural metaphors are appropriate rather than spaceship earth or something like that. And so I take the Bradley method as a metaphor of how to invite the native wisdom to return to human beings by removing the exotic anthropocentric ideas that we've been saddled with for a few thousand years. But what that suggests is that uh, we can't, uh, as much as we'd like to invite uh, the, um, you know, the oil company executive to attend the Council of All Beings, it's not going to work. That um, preaching to the choir is a very important thing to do and to allow the choir to grow and to become bigger. And eventually, if it succeeds, then we'll reach the oil company executive, but perhaps we just need to uh, leave that for another year because uh, the conditions aren't such right now that uh, we're going to be able to reach that person. Yeah, and we've had a number of um, discussions, you know, through other webinars and other events we've hosted where people ask that, you know, aren't we just preaching to the choir uh, or aren't we just talking to the usual suspects? And I often remind people that it's the usual suspects who care the most and actually need each other. And sometimes sharing with the choir as opposed to preaching um, is the one way that we keep each other going. And I, I certainly uh, support what you're, you've just said there, John, that we have to keep going and growing those discussions. Um, David has said, what is this thing with non-natives? It's so violent. It's not deep ecology at all. And he's mentioned that the Bradley sisters used pesticides. I have no comment on that. Um, 
I can certainly talk about compassionate conservation versus uh, people trying to protect original ecosystems, but rather than me respond, did uh, Pat or John, did you want to speak to anything about why it's important to care for natives perhaps more than exotics? Thoughts? <laughs> well, as a non-native. <laughs> <laughs> you would wholeheartedly support caring for exotics, yes? Um, I just think you got to look at time again, timing. And yeah, you know, I've, I went off and did a master's in botanical conservation about 12 years ago, and I've been working in botanic gardens and all sorts of things. All of the little daisy flowers that we have here or that are all around the world, whether they're any, anything looks like a daisy, they started in South America and they, uh, when there was gone one land, they kind of, you know, they managed to travel across bits of land bridges, but they blew across the ocean, sometimes thousands and th little seeds, thousands and thousands of miles because life was saying, get out of here, go and find something, um, make something happen. Now, I don't want to say that, you know, things like Japanese knotweed and other stuff that we've got that are absolutely awful in <laughs> invasive plants here. Uh, should be absolutely exterminated. I just think um, we've got to look at the populations. We've got to look at the plant population. Someone else has mentioned about the human population and how populations expand, find niches, survive or not. Um, I'm, I'll jump from exotics from the question about the Bradley sisters because I don't know a lot about that. I just know that um, China and Japan are facing massive depopulations at the moment as their um, uh, China's one child policy kicks in. Um, there's other countries where the populations are still expanding a lot, but there's an awful lot of, um, if you like, natural balancing happening at the moment too. Um, I want to just talk about for a moment, China, because I was I was um, doing some research work on Chinese medicinal plants. And I was amazed when I started to read about China's conservation programs and their desire to make large parts of their land um, national park and to start trying to um, repair. I thought, really, do I believe this? You know, but hey ho, you know, let's, let's give them a chance. I'm just reading in the latest New Scientist magazine about how China's um, it's it's the world leader in reducing emissions and creating technologies, um, and it's it's they say an almost ludicrously rapid pace to meet its targets of meet, you know peaking emissions by two thirty. There's uh, 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 this is jumping ahead, but it's also saying that there is a hell of a lot of stuff that is happening that is going on that you might say oh the politicians and the international bodies are just completely ignorant. And ignoring. I think there's an awful lot of work going on that we don't always find out about as well. And wherever we do find out about it, you know, to just, um, if if there's a chance to give it a thumbs up or whatever to do that. And the, um, yeah, I'll, I'll let John go back to the issue about natives and non-natives, but I think basically, you know, all species have jumped and evolved and moved on, and there will be fights, unfortunately, but there are times. And I think we are we can do judicious weeding wherever we are, but that's not about taking people out, <laughs> taking out things that we don't like. It's about how do we put something in that is a better balancer? How do we contribute something that brings the balance of a system back? That's... And certainly, if I may just interject again, from an earth jurisprudence or earth laws or whole of ecosystem perspective, what we're interested in is having as much diversity as possible and having as much of the beautiful patchwork quilt of bio life, bio and cultural, biocultural uh, systems across the planet. So where possible, if a certain introduced species is absolutely devastating or destroying or making extinct other species, um, if people can do careful, non-pesticide related um, yeah. nurturing of the unique species, um, then our, we certainly within the Earth Laws movement would say that's a viable and important thing to do. Um, we can't always control and people and plants and animals have always moved across the continent, across the, the shifting tectonic plate driven continental movement. However, we do live at a time and we know this since the 1950s, particularly built on top of 500 years of colonialism, the great acceleration means we have wiped out intense patches and spaces and ecosystems 
So we do have a custodial obligation to care for the life that's around us. And I think if anyone says you should absolutely not stop any feral things, it's all good, then I don't think you've noticed what's going on in certain places and the beauty of restoring places, you know, where they even have a fenced off area and bring back some bilbies or those quolls. What, what is greater joy than having our evolutionary companions return to their homeland? Uh, I think that's a very important objective as human beings. And I, I wanted to reflect just for a moment before we go to some more questions. Um, as many folks may know, I'm a co-director of an Indigenous and non-Indigenous partnerships org called Future Dreaming. And just yesterday, we had an amazing conversation about decolonizing our thinking, feelings and action with Mary Graham and Yin Paradis. And we do a lot of other work with folks through Regem Songlines. Um, and, you know, there's so many elements that connect with deep ecology. Uh, and I think John or yourself, Pat, may have said this at the beginning of your talks. Um, Thomas Berry, uh, Macy, others have looked at the fact that once upon a time, all human beings had certain kinds of notions towards uh, our relationship with plants and animals. Um, but then the shifting, changing culture has changed that. Um, so what we see when First Nations peoples or Indigenous peoples on this continent share their thoughts and insights is a very strong commitment to a custodial obligation to care for the place, to care for each other, uh, to do the work, to look after country. And I just think there's a lot of other points that have resonated, uh, John, when you were talking about, you know, the ceremonies and the practices and the, you know, even the Council of All Beings, really trying to transform yourself into something else, that transcendence that comes with imagination. Human beings have done that for as long as anyone can trace, because we just love the notion of the plants and animals around us being kin. Um, yeah. So um, we're just, we can start to wrap up a little bit. Um, I'm just going through, Philip's doing a plug for Bush Heritage Australia, fabulous organization doing great things, can't agree more. Uh, Jamie has mentioned that feral horses are threatening extinction of five um, endemic uh, alpine species. Yes, coming back to that point that we don't want to be horrible to feral things, but we do want to be carers and custodians of the beautiful, unique uh, evolutionary companions that live around us. Um, I'm just looking at some other ones. What have we got? Yeah, I think Greg is saying something similar and I'm sorry, my keyboard has decided at this very moment to play up, so I can't quite read all of it. But yes, finding balance managing exotics so they don't replace or take over or colonize exactly. Um, yes. So before we start to wrap up, I wonder, John and um, Pat, if there's anything you wanted to talk about or share that I haven't asked you about yet um, that you feel would be wonderful for this conversation. Hey. <laughs> Where do I start? I'll come back to the Thinking Like a Mountain because we didn't quite complete the kind of origin of that book. And oh, yeah. Now. And it is continually being, um, so it was written in 1987, it was published in 1988, it's been republished in 2007, the links I've put through the chat. Um, it was it was a conversation, John, that kind of got the, the book going. Joanna had her publishers asking her for a book about where her work was now. The Council of Beings had come forward as a very strong and new form. And um, I met Joanna in San Francisco. John and I both at a conference for Interhelp in 1987. And Joanna was telling me that she had to go to Tibet to help rebuild a monastery for a teacher, um, her teacher, her Tibetan Buddhist teacher out there. And she had to be smuggled in and she had to go incognito and just disappear for a while to help do this. Um, but she needed a couple of chapters for the book. Um, could I help? So that's how I came in on that conversation. <laughs> but it was this, I'll go a step back because the thing about intention, however, for any of us, I just, it's for me, it's been such a truth that if I grab a, something out of the universe, out of the ethos, um, out of the ether that's suddenly kind of uh, speaking to me, I was walking through San Francisco before I had this conversation with Joanna and I went past a secondhand shop and they had a little brother portable typewriter, electric. It wasn't a laptop, it was before this. And I thought, oh, I could do something with that. So I went in and bought it for 40 bucks or whatever and I was carrying it around and I showed it to Joanna and I said, I'm going to write something. And she said, well, that's funny. Actually, I do need someone. <laughs> Would you like to write? <laughs> a couple of chapters in the book. John and I met the publishers with Joanna 
in the car park um, after the conference and discussed it. And we were throwing names around and what to do. And I, I was very clear, thinking like a mountain was great. And I think, John, you were, you know, it's a, it's a, it comes from Elder Leopold. It's a wonderful kind of sense of dropping deep into the earth to be able to find a voice. Um, the thing, this is just a historic note. The, um, the internet didn't really exist in 1987. And John had been looking at um, setting up networks in Australia. Um, I didn't know where I was going to go, but when I stayed in San Francisco for the conference, there was a guy there who worked on the internet for the military um, because the US military developed the internet as a dispersed system in case of a nuclear war, in case of major disaster, that information could still travel around even if you know parts of the earth were taken out. Um, and I had to come back to England. John went back to Australia. Joanna was in California and Arnie Nace was in Norway. Um, with the publishers, how do we create a book before the internet? And how do we create? So we had to kind of wing it. We had to wing it. I couldn't find anyone in Totnes and Devon. I, had, I found Christopher Titmus had email. He was a Buddhist teacher, but he didn't know how to use it. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't find anyone. So I went to London to the offices of the one network called GreenNet that was part of an international not-for-profit peace and environmental organizations network. And they just let me use their computers to do this. So we were sending in very early days, oh, how's chapter three going? John, what do you think about this? And we were trying to do it before email or before email really functioned. <laughs> so that book was one of the first books that was written just as the internet was being born and was coming into being, we had to find our way around that. So it was amazing it even happened <laughs> when it did. And it's still in print, which is extraordinary. It's gone to thousands and thousands of different groups, places, countries. In the early days, I was getting letters, and John, you probably were, handwritten letters from Korea, from Poland, from uh, people who'd somehow stumbled on the book and said, wow, can we do this? Can, how, do we, how do we use this book as a handbook, which was what it was intended. It was intended as a sort of do-it-yourself manual how-to, you know, use this exercise, have this reading, this poem, or whatever. And it's extraordinary that it still has legs. It hasn't gone into the, um, you know, the remainder section of the, the dusty mm. cellar. Um, That's um, fantastic. The, Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's kind of it was it was it was just a mixture of happenstance and people and the energy I think of the Interhelp conference, the work we'd been doing together. And um, the one thing I'd like to look at at this point, and it's a conversation with John, with lots of other people, is is there another book? Is there another voice or a collection of voices and creativity and expression that could be another little book? that might have some legs in the way that the thinking like a mountain has legs. <laughs> Still. I think it certainly could. It sounds, it sounds like a good idea. Uh, count us in too. We'd love to weave some uh, uh, structural or, uh, yeah, uh, I was going to say Thomas Berrien, but these days we're actually more informed by Mary Graham and the relationist ethos here in Australia. Um, I just wanted to point out Liz Downs has very kindly said if in the chat, if people want to learn more about the work done by the Rainforest Information Centre, which John started in 1979, uh, direct rainforest actions supported by deep ecology work and thinking, go to their website, um, www.rainforestinformation, and I've got something over my chat, and um, it, lots of terrific work done by Liz and John and many others um, connecting with allies in Ecuador connecting with rights of nature um, and one of their campaigns to get constitutional um, assessments of some of that. Uh, Siobhan Michelle, says, uh, yes, please. Just um, one piece that I would love to add is uh, now that Liz is here, that um, the Rainforest Information Centre um, recently won a court case before the Supreme Court in Ecuador to protect our beloved Los Cedros Biological Reserve and we used the um, uh, clause in the Ecuadorian constitution. Uh, the Ecuadorian constitution was the first in the world to include the rights of nature. And we used that and surprisingly won that. And um, that's ha had enormous ramifications uh, as a precedent for many other things. I'm wondering whether we could, whether we've got enough time to invite Liz to just tell us about that a little bit. 
for a few minutes. We have 10 minutes left. So, so long as she can do something in five minutes, that would be fine. Um, is she there? Are you there, Liz? Yeah, I'm here. I've been here for two yeah. hours. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, had, I just assumed I was not going to have time to talk, so I just put the thing in the chat. You don't have to. You website. can just refer people to the website. Yeah, I can, I'll just refer people to the website, I think. Um, I, 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 you know, I can't sort of add much more except... You know, really, that this um, campaign, you know, the, the campaigns that we support with Rainforest Information Centre or really encourage people to sort of, if you feel, you know, like learning more about how to directly um, support the grassroots, it's what we're all about. And um, if you do a deep ecology workshop, um, the, you know, a proportion of all the in ticket fees goes to these rainforest direct actions. Um, and yeah, one of our major campaigns has been in Ecuador. Um, and one of the things just to add from the Los Cedros win that's so interesting is that, um, you know, Indigenous groups all over the country are now um, taking that precedent and launching their own legal cases. Um, and this is really an example of, you know, something that I, I felt five years ago when I stood in the Los Cedros forest in the, you know, wreathing mists and the birds and all of that. And I got this really strong sort of message from the land, which was like, you know, what's happening here is a global game changer. You know, our consciousness is changing and, and Ecuador is a big part of this, a leader in this. And, and um, you know, just to see that unfolding and happening and, and you know, just to feel part of this greater intelligence, I think that's a lot of what this work for me, it certainly has engendered it for me in my own life as a, as a facilitator of this work also, but um, also, you know, in terms of encouraging activists to go out and go forth, you know, it's like, whatever we do is part of, it's, it's the greater earth intelligence calling us all. And we are also empowering when you bring in social justice, we're empowering those who haven't necessarily had a voice because of being oppressed by this enormous capitalist machine that we're all stuck in, but actually, you know, incredibly, you know, you know like, know all what we need to know to be able to to heal our, our earth and and it's like okay we just need to give people breathing space and then we also need to give non-human beings breathing space and the rights of nature is one um system way in which that can that can happen which is you know a growing movement at the moment that's all I've got yeah. to say. No, thank you. And that's all you need to say. You can refer people to this. The Los Cedros case is remarkable. And can I just give a quick plug? Because Ayla has been involved with rights of nature and legal personhood and ecocide and a whole bunch of other um, ecocentric systems that are challenging Western law. You know, these ideas in different formats are not new to Indigenous, but they are extremely new to um, changing Western law and its human centered and property focused nature. Um, for 10 years, Ayla has been involved in sharing information about rights of nature, working with lots of communities around Australia interested in the ideas, but it's incredibly difficult to change Australian law. And if there's no hook in the law, uh, there's no way to bring these things in. Um, on the 28th of September, we will have literally a marathon from 9am in the morning till about 8pm that night. Obviously, you don't all have to join the whole day. Um, uh, if you're on the Ayla email list, you will be seeing notes about this. Um, we'll have speakers from um, the US, two speakers from Ecuador, including Hugo Echeverria, who's been involved in the constitutional cases, and Natty Green from the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, and others from India, the Philippines, Spain, um, some discussions from folks from Germany and Romania, uh, and I apologise if I've forgotten some of the other countries. So it will be um, a giant love in trying to get a catch up on some of these remarkable, important developments in law uh, around the world. So thank you very much, John and Liz, for sharing um, the incredible work you're doing and that wonderful win for Los Cedros Forest. I actually think I met in uh, earlier this year one of the a young woman from Ecuador who'd been involved as well. So um, I must mention her to you one day, Liz, and see if uh, she was part of your work. Um, so look, we're just about out of time and what I might do is start to wrap up. Firstly, I would love to thank Pat and John for your incredible generosity, sharing these incredible stories, you know, through several decades of really 
I guess, very difficult times as they continue and your work, which continues to be really important and more and more relevant. And I'd like to thank everyone for being on this epic discussion. Uh, everyone in our live audience, thank you so much. Anyone listening to the recording, thanks for being with us and sticking with us. And especially for those in the live audience, really want to encourage you to have a little peek at the earthlaws.org.au website. Uh, you'll find a beautiful blue banded bee bum uh, as a little logo on the website. If you click on the little bee bum, that'll take you to the calendar for Earth Laws Month and you'll see a range of different events. And one thing that Ayla will be hoping to do over the coming months is connect more and more to the work that people like Pat and John are doing. Um, I'm really keen to find how we can promote your, um, you mentioned, John, there's a regular meeting of facilitators for the work that reconnects, um, you know, and we would love to continue to promote your work on the website, cross-promote things to people. And as, as Philip and others suggested, get the word out to more folks and uh, keep supporting each other through the terrific work. Um, can I perhaps hand to you, Pat and John, for the final word, any final thoughts or just a farewell and goodbye? Or did you want to read a poem? You've got time, John. Um, yeah, well, I, I wrote to uh, Michelle this morning saying that if we we're going to be talking about Thomas Berry calling for the poets to tell the story, um, that um, one of the poets that responded to this was the uh, young, at the time, rapper from Prescott, Arizona, Drew Dellinger, and that I offered to share his universe jam. The flame has lit up the world from within. All things, individually and collectively, are interpenetrated and flooded by it. You who mould the manifold so as to breathe your life into it, I pray to you. The first verse of the universe, universe, pours forth like a sea of mystery. Out of the void, unmanifest silence. Space-time comes into existence, unseen shaping, swirling, unfurling. Hydrogen, helium, divine is revealed within galactic whirlpools. As energy flows in, a star collapses, supernova explosion, a cloud of cosmic debris. Drawn together by gravity, by the mystery of attraction, primordial bonding, universe action, stars swirling, swarming gases, organizing and forming masses. See, the sun is the one that spun the nine others, give birth to Mother Earth and assist their brothers. Mercury, Venus, Mars and Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto, everyone is the sun. The sun is the one, everyone. Everybody better wake up. And the earth gave birth to continents and oceans, shaping and shaping in waves of emotion, crashes of lightning, bombarding and striking, exposing the globe as it glows like a strobe and setting the stage for the first cell of life. So simple, so basic, so primal that I placed it at the top of the chain from which all life sprang. More forms adorn the earth as they breathe. Diversity dispersing the song of creation. Ring in the dawn, sing along in celebration. I just want to celebrate, celebrate life. I just want to celebrate, celebrate earth. I just want to celebrate, celebrate the cosmos. I just want to celebrate. The sea comes alive, starts to thrive with new life forms. Storms sweep the planet, plants quake on granite and chant by the sun's solar power. The earth gave birth to green leaves and flowers. Lava flows, mountains rose, tropical islands, forests and meadows, fed by the fresh water streams, the veins, heavenly rains drain back to the sea. The fish are set free as they swim onto sand. Fins turn to limbs and they limp onto land. Amphibians, reptiles, new styles of creature, seeing through new being, the range of her features. The earth, your mother, gave birth to eyesight. Looking within as she spins in the sunlight, on to the dawn, to the day of the dinosaur. Pterodactyl soils, Tyrannosaurus rex, towering, devouring. So who's up next? Mammals and primates, all life interrelated. Divine and created. So don't you think it's time we celebrate it? 
I just want to celebrate, celebrate life. I just want to celebrate, celebrate earth. I just want to celebrate, celebrate the cosmos. I just want to celebrate. Thank you. Woo that was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, um, that's that's going to be an earworm caught in my head all day, which I'm actually really happy about. Um, thank you so much, John. And Pat, um, whether you want to sing, dance, do some performance <laughs> art, or just say farewell, did you have anything you'd like to say before we uh, shut down for the for the sesh? I just want to say big gratitude to you, Michelle, for being such a wonderful, generous, humorous, and um, loving host. It's been it's been lovely. It's been a process. It's been a mutual engagement process to see where we go with this. And I'm going away mm. with a few things tucked under my belt, and I hope other people do as well. And just you know, see where we go. And thank you, John, as ever. And it's just. Yeah, it, these sort of conversations just are so, um, for me, so nourishing and give me give me a good sense of being alive. Thank you. Thank you. I, I agree with everything that you sang, spoke, and have just said. Um, thank you, everybody. These conversations are important, whether we're preaching to the choir or roping in a few new folks. Um, I think we do need to support each other and enliven each other. So I'm certainly going to go off and be singing I just want to celebrate everything. And um, John and Pat, I look forward to further collaborations in the future. And folks, um, when we email you a link to the recording, we'll also reattach uh, the little list of resources and such. But please do look up our lovely speakers, check out their resources, and keep talking about the work that reconnects and all of the things we need to do to, to be happy humans whilst uh, living in challenging times. So. Thank you again to our everybody who's stuck it out. It's been an epic two hours, but I tell you what, I have enjoyed every minute of it. So thank you again. And we'll uh, see Michelle, you soon. Uh, can we yes. have the chat? Can we have the chat log as well? I haven't had a chance to catch the chat. Absolutely. There's some lovely feedback in there, and I'll absolutely share that with you. That's terrific. So and um actually, John, could you send us a reference to the poem? Uh the song. Of course. The, yeah. The jam, baby, the jam. I am so cool and hip. It's all happening. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Have a lovely afternoon. We'll see you soon. Bye.